Hi, Peter Walker here and welcome to today's edition of The Transition Guy. Now joining me today at the Scale Up Summit in Atlanta is Danny Corbin. Thanks for having me. Oh, thanks for coming. Now Danny's going to be one of the speakers. He's actually going to be the closing act on day two of our Scale Up Summit. And that's quite a tough gig actually. Yeah, the more, the closer to this date it got and the more I thought about it, I was like, oh, this is like a big gig. <laughs> It is a big gig, it is. actually. It is. I mean, you're talking about you're going to be in front of a thousand entrepreneurs that are going to be a tough crowd, going to be quite demanding, probably seen a lot. Yeah, seen a lot, heard a lot. Yeah. And it's been two days of just nonstop with the best speakers and authors in the world. So you've really been, <laughs> that is true. But then again, you've been brought in to really leave everybody on a high. So how did you end up becoming a, a magician? What's the story there? So I've always loved magic my whole life. Mm -hmm. I think like a, a lot of us probably have. Like you probably as a kid had a magic set at some point or learned a card trick. Yeah, I uh, sucked. Yeah. <laughs> That's why you're coaching it and I'm doing this. <laughs> um, <no. laughs> but uh, so always loved magic, always loved uh, just making people laugh and smile and had a very supportive family. So whether they wanted to do magic or drums, no matter what, they fully supported me. So I am born and raised and still live in Scranton, Pennsylvania. So if you guys watch or are from the United States and watch the TV show, The Office, uh, it's what the show is based off of. My family owns the paper supply company in Scranton. So we are like the real life Dunder Mifflin. Um, so uh, my dad's a serial entrepreneur, uh, has I think over three, 400 employees, a couple businesses and in, in, in the YPO. So when I was younger, I was like, oh, I'm gonna, you know, third generation family business, I'm gonna take it over. It's going to be great. I'm going to join the YPO. And uh, ever since I was 16, stripped and waxed floors, clean bathrooms, worked in every aspect of the family business and uh, got up to sales after school. And we were on a family vacation and my dad just goes like, you uh, hate this shit, don't you? And uh, I was still doing shows and stuff every now and then, like once or twice a month doing little odd gigs. And uh, he knew I had a passion for it. So he goes, uh, listen, you don't want to be 30, 40, 50 going, what if? So when we get back from the trip, why don't you, uh, you know, take a year, two years, whatever. Uh, you, always, you always have a place here, but go and at least try and do that first. And that's quite unusual because very often with many of the third or fourth family based generation businesses, what you tend to find is that there's an expectation that actually, you know what, you're part of the family, you're going to work in the business. And I've come across so many people that are absolutely as miserable as sin doing something they absolutely hated. So the fact that your father actually recognized it wasn't your passion, yeah. that's, that's, really, that's really big. Looking back, I can definitely see, you know, you know hi, uh, hindsight's always, always 20, 20 Looking back, I see some of the moves he made and I was like, that is genius. Uh, like for example, you know, when I was working for him doing sales, I was paid pretty much minimum wage. He goes, well, you're in sales, you're gonna eat what you kill. And I was like, well, I can't, you know, not, mm. not that. So, you know, so it's, it's early on. I think if he would have paid me like a better salary or, you know, just whatever, I think I probably would have stayed around longer, if not probably didn't leave. Just because I'm like, oh, this is, this is comfy. But, you know, I think at that point he knew I wasn't making much. I'm in sales. So I was like, well, if I'm not making much working for him, I can just book one or two shows a month, make the same amount, and I can do what I like. I think I'm onto something, you know, so I think that was like part of it is like, oh, well, I can live on crap money for now because I'm used to it. But so if I can do this and then grow it up, it's all, it's all up a pill from here. But you've actually turned this into a proper business, haven't you? Yeah. Yeah. It's been a very fun business. It's a very fun, very fun ride. Uh, very early on, I realized after like six months to a year, just gonna have a website up and a social media presence. I thought people were going to like flood my door. Like, you know, every day people contacting me for gigs, I realized that doesn't happen. Um, and you know what's interesting, there's so many people out there that put their website up, they do a little bit of social media, so they do the occasional tweet and the occasional <laughs> post, and they're, 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 they're waiting for these people to sort of come in contact and say, yeah, do you know what? I've done my bit now, where's the business? Well, you know, I think even going back to Gary Vaynerchuk a little bit too, I don't know, if we, I think we talked about it before, that's not on here, but uh, you know, they, but all their posts on social media are, are the, uh, you know, as jab, 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 right hook, yeah. they're all buy my shit, buy my shit, it's not, you know, here's some value, here's some value, here's some value. So when people do see, if you do post, and all you're asking for is the business, people are just gonna scroll past you because they just know you're trying to, they're trying to get like, your money from them. So 
And for you, your business has been built on sort of a couple of key pillars. So one of them is persistence, isn't it? Yeah. Uh, so when I'm not home, or when I'm home, I don't have a gig for a couple of days. I try to spend one to four hour, hours a day, even if I am traveling and doing shows, I still try to spend one to four hours a day on like money making activities. So phone calls, emails, I still consider like a post on social media because that's staying front of mind, in front of mind awareness, just doing something to at least, you know, even if I only go 20 minutes in, into my CRM and just, I might still be behind, but as long as I'm still just knocking things off and keeping in touch with people and following up on events and different things. And that's really important, the whole thing around persistence and consistency is actually making sure you work out there. A lot of people cannot handle rejection. Now, very often you'll speak to people and they just don't do nothing with you. How do you handle that rejection? Uh, it sucks. I mean, I don't think it, I don't think you ever get over it. Like it still sucks. Uh, but at the end of the day, it's like, I know there's, there's, for me, there's so many events. There's so many other events I can do that, hey, if I'm not a good fit with them, that's completely fine. Because uh, that just means I can go to try and book another show someplace else. Uh, I think sometimes it boils down to personality too. Mm -hmm. Like if you just don't click with that person, they don't click with you, it's just not going to work. So I'd rather not do that because if we're yeah. not going to be a good fit, I'd rather just wait and work for like the great people we just like click and jive with. But a lot of the people that you deal with, because you're very much into the corporate market, and I know what corporates are like because they have the great illusion that they want to do something. Yeah. But very often they'll say they want to do something and then all of a sudden you get hit with the word, there's no budget at the moment, yeah. we can't do anything. How do you make sure that they don't go cold? How do you actually make sure that you keep them on your radar? And more importantly, you're on their radar. So I, I always try to find them on LinkedIn minimum. Uh, if we talk and we click, like you, you know, there's people who talk on the phone, you just know like, oh, yeah, these are like my people. I'll find them on like Instagram or Facebook. Um, and then also, so I know that they don't go silent on me towards the end of my phone call. So I talk to every single person. Uh, Cause to me, I'm like big, I like the energy and getting the vibes from people. So at the end of my calls, I say, listen, the, you know, I've been super upfront and honest with you. I, I just want the same for me. If, you know, you, you said you had a meeting in two weeks or in a week, if you if 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 you if we want to work together, great. Obviously, you're going to let me know. If I'm too expensive, just tell me. If you guys went in a different direction, just tell me. Because the last thing I want is to send you 20 emails. You know, so I'll, that'll just start going on, and, and, and they kind of laugh because they get it. I said, just, let's just be, j j just tell me. Like, just mm -hmm. tell me. No matter what, good, bad, I can take it. It sucks when like they say no, but I'd rather them tell me, listen, we can't afford it. Or at least they can then tell me why, oh, we went with a different act because of this. Oh, we went with a DJ because of whatever. So now I know for the future, oh, they went with a DJ. So now I'll call, hey, how is the DJ? Sometimes I'll go, uh, well, you know, not everybody dances this and that. So then that gives me an opportunity to sell it. Maybe not like a full show, but instead just have me mingling around doing like little close up stuff, you know? So it gives me a different opportunity to sell. So you keep products. working the relationship, working the relationship. Yeah. I know you're saying to me off, off camera that basically you've had clients where nothing's happened for four years. Oh yeah. And that's the important thing is about not giving up, isn't it? Yeah, it's just, and in, in, in we talked about it as well, it's not caring. Like, it's not that they don't like you. I mean, once in a while I'm sure that the, you know you just rub people the wrong way for whatever reason, they could have had a bad day, you called and, hey, you wanna buy this? And they're like, no. Uh, but there are people you could just rub the wrong way. But for the most part, they, most people, in, especially in the corporate world in these jobs, other people, you know, whether they've been downsized, whatever, so people have a lot more on their plate. So they might want to get back to you, but it might not be a good time. Or they see the email because they're on the road and they mm -hmm. see, oh yeah, I'll get back to that later. And the next thing you know, they're on their desktop. It's the next day. All the emails go past. So it's just staying in touch that way. Um, and you know, it's human nature. I, I, I'm the same. I will sometimes need to get back to someone and I've got all the intention in the world that I'm going to get back to that person but shit happens, your date gets in, another email, phone call, another thing you have to go and deal with and before you know it, it's out of your sight, out of your mind. You don't mean to be rude, Yeah. it's just part and parcel what happens. One of the biggest things I've been doing is texting my clients. Yep. Because to me, A, who do you text? Your friends and family and people that yeah. you like and B, even if they're on the phone or doing something else, you can always respond to a text. And uh, actually they do. Yeah. So like, there's been a bunch where I'm just like, hey, have, hey, it's Denny. Haven't heard back. You know, are we a go? Just something simple. And plus it allows me to connect more personality because of emojis and gifts and stuff. Like, oh, that's And a lot of people best. find that quite difficult because it's not in their 
comfort zone, so to speak. Well, it's not even a comfort zone, but I think what you lose with email and text is you can't tell how sincere people are. You can't, you can't, you, it's hard to gauge how someone feels. So like when I, I try to add smiley, you know, just whatever funny faces or funny gifts that I can put in, that kind of opens up the door. So if I want to say something, you know, instead of just putting LOL, you put something funny so they kind of get it. Uh, build rapport, exactly, build a relationship. Exactly. So, I mean, you've, you've built quite a significant business in a short period of time. Within five years, you've got to a very good level. What's next for you? This year's gonna be a really good, fun year. Uh, I've focused a lot on the corporate stuff, mm -hmm. and uh, this year there's a lot of TV things coming out, like big TV appearances. Uh, there's a TV show called Penn and Teller Fool Us. Uh, Penn and Teller are the two, the one really big guy, one really short guy, the magicians from Vegas. Uh, the longest standing show in Vegas. In Vegas, yeah. Uh, so they're seriously big, big, big. And they started big. Fool Us uh, over in Europe, now it's over here in the States, and uh, I'll be appearing on it this summer, and there's a couple other projects I'm working on, so. And how important has business education been in your journey? Oh, tremendous. Um, I think that's where a lot of magicians and people in the arts, even the comedians and uh, that whole spectrum, that's where they fall at the wayside, personally, I think. I think you still have to spend time on your craft, on the creativity side, mm -hmm. but then also on the business side, like the professional development side. Um, plus, it's just great networking too, because now you're with other people who want to do better too. So it's just like, oh, well, comedians there, he must be good too. So it's just kind of like that ongoing, plus you just feel good about yourself. So how do you work on yourself? How do you sort of get your business education? Uh, like I, tr I try to, if other magicians and people put out products and like lecture notes about business, granted it's usually all like the same stuff that I know, but sometimes there's still that one little nugget that you know you may have read or known mm -hmm. before, but now you're in a different mindset, different place. You're like, oh, I forgot about that, that, that that's amazing. Um, I read like a lot of business books, podcasts, audio books. Um, yeah, I mean, it's just, you just never know where you're gonna pick, some, pick something up from. And do you ever, any, ever have anybody hold you accountable, help you? Oh yeah, yeah, I've had a, a business coach in the past. Uh, That's quite unusual for a magician, right? <laughs> extremely, extremely. And uh, it was not cheap, so uh, it definitely pushed me because I was like, well, I paid for this, so definitely going to uh, get the most value out of it. Um, and I know a lot of people out there, they get really scared around getting a business coach. I mean, they think about the investment and it does frighten them. But at the end of the day, I think it's no coincidence that you are where you are because you were prepared to back yourself. Yeah. And that's the thing, it's about making sure that you are able to learn and grow. And actually, I see it with accountants, I see it with lawyers, where they, they know their craft, but they never learn the business element. And I, and I would say that the business element is as important as a craft. I'll give you a great example. I've just finished Kevin Hart's book. Really? Yeah, and it's an epic book. I mean, apart from all the bad language of swearing, I mean, he's hilarious. But what he's grown into, the kind of entrepreneur he's grown into, and actually how much time he spends on his business, it's no surprise the man is an absolute machine. I just, I actually just last week listened to his podcast with uh, Joe Rogan. Yeah. Uh, that was a really good podcast. Um, talking about his new like like vitamin company and everything he's doing. Yeah, he's just, he just, he just, he just nailing it. But again, it goes back to know where you want to go, be persistent, be prepared to learn. You're going to have to take a few knocks along the way. Yeah. But if you truly believe in the dream and you really want the dream, it's about doing whatever it takes. Make sure you've got the right people around you to help you get there. And you've done all those things. It's it's so funny. So one of my friends is, is uh, Jack Daly, who's yeah. one of the speakers here. And his whole thing is system and process, system and process. And even listening to the Kevin Hart uh, podcast, that man works. Yes, he does. Works. So he'll spend three to six months just doing comedy clubs. Like the guy who sells out arenas and, and stadiums doing comedy clubs so he can build up that from the comedy club. Once he gets that, that set working well, then he goes like a small theater then he goes to a big theater, then he tries a smaller arena. If it doesn't feel right, he goes back down to theaters. Then if the theaters start feeling with, then he keeps going back down so he can build it back up. Then once he does one big show, then he knows he'll try another. I think once he does three successful, I think like bigger arena shows, then he takes it on tour. And he said basically it took him 15 years to actually become an overnight success. Oh yeah. And that just shows you how much persistence is. Well, Thank you so much for your time today. It's been a pleasure. Thank you so much for having me. This it's is fun. A, it's been a pleasure. I look forward to seeing you on the big stage. Oh man. And if anything has sort of resonated with you, whether it's around sort of finding your passion, having that ability to be persistent, 
making sure that you're systemized and processed and you want to explore it further, head over to Borka.com and get in touch. And remember, failing to learn is learning to fail.